All right, one, two, three. Esta es mi Biblia. Oye, oro, oro. It is the inspired, infallible word of Yah. Es una la pa mi espías. Oye, mole si es me. I find out who I am en las páginas contenidas en este documento. E yene Biblia me. Still have one more minute of morning, so good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well today. Didn't ask how you were doing, but thank you. <laughs> this message is going to be fun. Amen. We're going to focus on a few things I've touched upon in the past, but putting it all together and for this eye-opening experience. Now, even my eyes... We're open with this, and maybe only two people that are members of this church might do more studying than me. So I will venture to say and wager to say that it will be eye-opening to you as well. So the principal verse that we're going to have is a very cliche verse. It is a Bible verse that we have hanging here in our sanctuary. It is Hebrews thir chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. And it says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of Yah to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now you notice that I have uh, yesterday underlined and bolded and italicized. Now this anonymous author of Hebrews has a reference for today, correct? For their today. Because the Messiah left, and that is there today, and there tomorrow is the future. The Messiah left today, and he said, the future, this is what I have for you. I'm, le I'm breathing out the Spirit onto you all. But we're going to focus on Jesus' yesterday. Because we have so much evidence that Jesus has always been, right? The easiest verse to reference is the Gospel of John in the beginning. So let's go there so that we can have that reference because we're going to gather a whole lot of evidence today. And we're going to, let, I'm going to let you make your own determinations and then we'll have a conclusion. So John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He, so that's what they call in, in English class, they call that personification. <laughs> He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. Now it says that the word became flesh. The action of the Most High became flesh. So he had to exist beforehand before he became flesh, correct? John is calling him the word. Now, why would he be doing that? We know in this church the answer to that, but let's go there quickly because we need to gather all of the evidence, right? Because John, the disciple whom Jesus loved according to John, he knows the Messiah's true name. So we have to go to Revelation chapter 19, 11 through 14. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider was called Faithful and True. With justice, he, wait, he judges and wages war. He doesn't sound like no punk. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of Yah. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. So they were definitely had their drip on and they was ready for battle. But what did it say that his name was? The Word. And we just got from John chapter 1 that the Word is a person. And the Word has always been. And through the Word, through the action, through this person, all things were made. So one thing to remember, this writer commands the armies in heaven. Doesn't it say that? And secondly, the writer has a name, the word. The same that John refers to the Messiah as in John chapter 1. 
So the Messiah is the writer at the end of time. This is Revelation talking about the end of time. But he was also there during the beginning of time. He was also there during creation. So a problem we will have to we have is people try to take away the deity of Christ. They will say, well, he was a good prophet. He was a good teacher, but he was not the son of the most high. But there's a problem when people say that and they're trying to be polite and give credit to the good things that Jesus did. At least they're not as, as crazy as people that say that he, he doesn't exist. But they're trying to say he was a good dude. He was a good teacher. and a, He was a good prophet. But there's a problem with that, right? Because he prophesied on being the son of the most high. So how can he be a good prophet? The only way he could be a good prophet is if this is true. He taught that he was indeed the son of the most high. So the only way he can be a good teacher is if he was teaching correctly. So he had to be either a liar, a lunatic, or the son of the heavenly father. Those are the only thing. There is no other way. Either he's lying about being the son of the most high, or he's crazy and thinks he's the son of the most high, or he actually is. You can't say he was a good prophet and good teacher when he prophesied about being the son of God. Can't say he was a great teacher when he taught specifically about being the son of the most high. It's either all or nothing. So let's focus on what John said in John chapter 3, because he said through him all things were made. Did he not? So let's go to the beginning. As I think this will be our last cliche verse, and we're going to really hit the ground running, so I hope you're ready. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Then Yah said, Let us, somebody say us, us. make mankind in our image, in our Likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. The Father said, Our likeness. The one we call Jesus, along with the Holy Spirit, were the our. That's O U R, sorry. Creation is being done by multiple people, as it says in John chapter 1. Through him, all things were made. He was there in the beginning. He was the, the, the model for mankind. And all, along with the Holy Spirit, we're the model for mankind. That's a whole other sermon that we did before, and people got mad at us, so we're not going to revisit that now. All things were created through him, so that he was the creator. Because if you're creating things, that makes you a creator. Right? So Jesus is the creator. Let's keep grabbing evidence because Jesus himself testified about existing before 0 AD. I know that we divide time up before Christ and at Amudinami and after death, but there is no before Christ because he always was. So let's look because Jesus testifies that he was around during the reign of King David. Luke chapter 20, verse 41 through 44. Then Jesus said to them, why is it said that the Messiah is the son of David? So this is Luke chapter 20. So a lot of things have gone on, right, in his ministry. We're getting towards the end of the book. And they, a lot of people don't say, son of David, son of David. And I guess Jesus had enough of it. And he's like, yo, how is the Messiah the son of David? David himself declares in the book of Psalms, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And this is still Jesus talking. David calls him Lord. How then can he be his son? How can I be his son and his Lord? Now, you guys know that I normally don't use the term Lord, but we're going somewhere deeper here. So give me a moment. But I need people to understand that Jesus was not some meek guy. I know in all the paintings and the movies, he's just so nice and humble and just laid back, look like a, a strong wind would knock him over. Y'all gonna get it. He was very boastful about his deity. 
And yes, he referred to, himself, referred to himself as the son of man more frequently than the son of Yah. But as we studied before, the son of man is a very high title to give to oneself. But let's read what David said, because we're getting ahead. I'm getting ahead, I should say. But let's, because he said that David said this in the book of Psalms. Let's go to that book. Let's go to that and see what he's talking about. That is in Psalms chapter 110, verse 1. Yah says to my master, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, in your NIV, your nearly inspired version, or your King Jimmy, it will say, the Lord says to my Lord. But that doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it, because how can the same Lord talk to the same Lord? Right? That verse always puzzled me when I would hear it. Like, how, can, how am I talking to myself? And then you get into people having a, a struggle to describe the Trinity to people. Like, well, they're, they're, it's like an apple, and this is God, and this is God, and that is God. David calls on Jesus. He does this through the Holy Spirit. Now, and again, in that bad translation, it is hard to understand exactly what he is saying. But the first time that they say, Matt, uh, Lord, it is saying, Yah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, whatever you want to say. He's talking about the Father in heaven. The second Lord is the word Ladonai. Now that may strike your ear and like that kind of sounds like Adonai. Adonai is the name for the father, more specifically a royal king father. Ladonai means master or prince, the son of the king. David is saying, Yah the father says to the prince, sit at my right hand. And where does Jesus sit in heaven? And we knew this. Before 0 AD, because David said it. David said he's already been told him where to sit. He didn't get this instruction in the book of Acts. Because when you break this down to the lowest common denominator, this makes sense. So again, let's read it in the, in, in the English. God says to Jesus, sit at my right hand. Where does Jesus sit in heaven? We talked about that. Let's get some more evidence of Jesus yesterday, okay? Let's look at Father Abraham. Going to go to John chapter 8, verse uh, 48 through 59. The Jews answered him, Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? I am not possessed by a demon, said Jesus. I, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself. But there is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. Very truly, I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see death. As this they, at this they exclaim, now we know that you're demon-possessed. Abraham died, and so did the prophets. Yet you say that whoever obeys your word will never taste death? Are you greater than our father Abraham? He died, and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Jesus replied, if I glorify myself, my glory means nothing. My father, whom you claim, somebody say claim, claim, claim as your God, is the one who glorifies me. Though you do not know him, I know him. If I said I did not, I would be a liar like you, but I know him and I obey his word. I don't get down like you. Your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. Abraham wishes he could have been like me. He saw it and was glad. Brother, you not even 50. You have not seen no Abraham. Sorry for my bonnets translation. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born... I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Now, we're about to really get, get into it here. First, Jesus mentions that he saw Abraham rejoice. Got it? He didn't read about it. He saw it. You know, I was there. Abraham can get down. Now, the second part, 
is so key, and we will touch on it a little bit later. But in verse 58, and you guys said it before I read it, he says, I am. That is why they try and stone him. But why would they try to stone him? Because he said he was alive before Abraham. The answer is because he didn't say that. He didn't say merely I am. He used an ancient name for God. He said I am that I am. Which in the Hebrew is Ahia. He said Ahia. This is why they wanted to stone him. Because all Jesus did if we just read it in the English. All he did was lie about his age. That's not a capital offense, is it? Lying about your age, saying you're thousands of years old versus 33, that wouldn't get him killed, would it? But claiming to be God would get him killed. Claiming to be the king of the Jews would get him killed. The things that he did, which is the reason why they kept telling Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. I do not want to jump ahead, but I can't help it. Jesus used the same phrase that was said to Moses when Moses said, who shall I say sent me? The voice in the bush replied, tell them I am that I am sent you. Jesus used the same phrase when asked, have you seen Abraham? This is why they wanted to stone him. Because he just said, I'm the dude that was in the bush. If you look at John chapter 8, verse 48, and I think this is in my notes somewhere else, but I don't want to leave here. If you look at John chapter 8, verse 58, in the original Aramaic, when they ask him, you are not 50 years old, they said, have you seen Abraham? Very truly, I tell you, before Abraham was born, and this is in the Aramaic, it says, I am the living God. He said, I am Elohim. That's why they wanted to stone him. They didn't want to stone him because he said, I'm old. They wanted to stone him because he used an ancient name to God for himself. We're going to come back to this, but let's keep grabbing evidence. Let's go to when Jesus met Abraham. Genesis chapter 22, 1 and 2. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son whom you love, which is a little weird because he ain't mentioned Ishmael, <laughs> Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Again, I'm purposely reading this in the bad translation so I can really show you something that will open your eyes. You guys saying with me? So Abraham gets asked to sacrifice his son, correct? Now we are thought to this be to God the Father. But let's fast forward and see what happens. Because God says, I want you to take your son and sacrifice him. Are we all there? We know this story, right? Uh, Verse 9. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took a knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know. I didn't previously. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld him from me, your son, your only son. So this angel, quote unquote, says, now I know that you fear God. And the word that's used there is, is Yah the Father. So this, is, this person that's talking is not God the Father, right? Because he said, I know that you fear God. But what does he say next? You have not withheld him from me. I was the one that told you to do it. And then I saw that you were going to do it. Now I can trust you. Because what you've been believing for all these years, you were willing to sacrifice to me. Now I know that you love my dad because you were willing to go the extra mile for me. Read that for yourself. Don't think I'm making up stuff, you know, that I'll be changing the words 
for when it's the names of God, but I don't change the story. He said, you fear God, but you withheld him from me. This is the person that Abraham was talking to previously. Now, the word angel, and we see it so many times, it just means messenger or somebody from heaven. It doesn't mean a person with wings. Like, if you do a study of quote-unquote angels, you see that there are different names and ranks. Uh, the lowest class of these heavenly beings is angels. Then you have archangels. Then you have wheels, authorities, principalities, cherubim, etc., etc. But that's an entire different study. So the sun, the sun, the God, the sun, as they say, is who creates this relationship with Abraham. Let's look at the grandson of Abraham. We know this story, but we have to look at it with new eyes. All right. Genesis chapter 32, 22 through uh, 30. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When, he, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was rich as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. So they was wrestling, and then the dude cheated and messed up his hip. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. But Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed them there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, I, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. Now, everybody knows how I feel about Mr. Jacob. Jacob had a little bit of wickedness in him. He had some sin in him. Could he have stood face to face with Yah the Father, with wickedness? Wouldn't have been able to happen. But there is one that he could stand face to face with. And then what did Jesus say? Anyone that has seen me has seen the Father. So you, let's keep on going. Jacob wrestled and struggled with God face to face or better interpretation would be God in the flesh. And who is God in the flesh? He has always been acting on behalf of his father. Let's keep going. Exodus chapter three is when uh, Moses encounters the burning bush and says to tell the people, I am sent you. Whoa. Or my notepad just closed. Tell them, Ahia has sent you. We touched on this previously about this phrase, but let's look at some times when Jesus uses that phrase, I am. We talked about it before when they were asking about Abraham. He uses the phrase so many times in the Gospels. He said it, I am the truth. I am the vine. I am the resurrection. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the light. I am the bread of life. I am the way. This is a directly reflective of what was said to Moses. I am going to be whatever you need me to be, is what I am means. You need me to be a, a way for you to get across the Red Sea? I'll be that. You need a way to eat for 40 years in the desert? I'll be that. You need to be released from Egypt? I'll be that. Whatever affliction that you are, he said, I will be what you need. Now, you could argue that uh, I'm just discussing what he is saying, but let's look at some more evidence. John chapter 18, 1 through 6. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples. This is all right up when he's about to get arrested. And crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen, 
to him, went out and asked him, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Don't sound like he just said, yo, it's me. We get people to fall down. But if he says, I am Elohim, and then those people recognize in the spirit what they're doing, because we have to understand that a lot of the people that were involved in the actual killing, like not the Pharisees, but the actual governing bodies, they really didn't have much idea of who Jesus was. They heard little things about him. They didn't know the teachings that he had. They didn't know the power and authority that he walked with. Pilate kept saying, who are you? They keep they telling me the king, are you a king? Because Jesus, and I'm not trying to, to minimize his impact, heaven forbid. Jesus touched the lives of thousands while he was walking through, through this uh, Jerusalem, through Israel. But this is a country of millions of people. And we know this from history because they say in 70 AD, a million after the destruction of Israel, that over a million of them went into Africa. So we know that this is a country of over a million people because of historical evidence. So these people are going like, are we going to arrest this dude that they told us to go arrest? And then this guy says, I am Elohim. Best believe they fell down and drew back. And again, in the Aramaic version of this, Jesus says, I am the living God. So let's continue with the books of Moses. Let's continue looking at the Torah in Deuteronomy chapter 18, 15 through 18. Yahweh, your Elohim, will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked Yahweh, your Elohim, at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of Yahweh your Elohim, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. Yah said to me, what they say is good, I will raise up for them a prophet like you among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. Jesus mentioned this all the time throughout his ministry. I got this from the Father. I got this from the Father. I testify what he testifies. Moses gets specific instructions about who the Most High is going to send. So we spoke about Abraham, Jacob, and Moses' interactions, because these are the writings of Moses, right? The first five books. Now you could say that I've skewed these verses to fit my little agenda, but again, let's grab more evidence. Because I just have stated that the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, is about Moses explaining to the Israelites about the Son, God the Son, that this all was about Him. You guys following me there? Yeah. That's what I'm stating. Let's look at John chapter 1, verse 43 and 45. The next day, this is right after Jesus was baptized, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Beth. Bethsaida. <clears throat> Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the Torah. Because remember, Torah and law are interchangeable words. And about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. So he's like, yo, we found the one Moses has been talking about all this time. Now in the American church, because we get told things and not taught things, we think that the Torah is about God the Father. But we just have heard from people that are living there and know it's about the son. That's who it all was about. But maybe Philip is just a little off his rocker. So let's get some more evidence. John chapter 5, 46, 47. This is Jesus talking. If you believe Moses, because that's y'all boy. You will believe me, for he wrote about me. He wrote about my daddy, wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Because what Moses said, who you think put them words in his mouth? That's what he said at the burning bush. Who made man's mouth? I did. 
Jesus said, I'm the one that Moses wrote about in the law. The Pharisees even said that the law states that the Messiah will reign forever. The law says he'll reign forever. So how are you going? Philip notates that the prophets also wrote about him. We know Isaiah wrote about him. In John chapter 12, verse 41, it states that Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. But let's look at a verse that you may not be aware of. Because again, this is an eye-opening message. Remember, hopefully your eyes are open. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn child. Like an only begotten son, right? Jesus, as he is called, has always been. He was the creator of it all. He was part of the covenant with Abraham. He wrestled with Jacob and had the conversations with Moses. The Torah is literally about man's relationship with God the Son. Israel's relationship with God the Son. Now, why did I go over all of this? It wasn't just to show you how smart I can be. Because one, that's, that's not true. I am only have wisdom because of the Spirit. But I went over all of this because there's more reason for us to follow the Son and to put our lives in His hands. Because He's always been and He'll always be. Because He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He's the creator of all things. There's nothing that exists that He didn't create. That's what John 1 says. And we have this pledge at the beginning, the inspired, infallible Word of God. Act like it. That's why I have inspired and infallible underlined in that, in that pledge. He's always been, he's always had, he's always created, but you don't want to put your finances in his hand. He's always been, but you don't want to put your relationship with your significant other in his hands. He's always been, but you don't want to put your children's well-being in his hands. He's always been, but you don't want to put your church in his hands. The things that he's done that we have scriptural evidence of, he can handle your little problem. Not, not minimizing your situation, but, uh, but per, per what he did, he's like, yo, I'd be Goliath. I can get your rent paid by, by the first coming up in a few days. I done, we sung the song, I done closed the mouth of lions. I can find you a husband. Are your child sick or... <laughs> You remember the one with issue of blood? Your, your daughter been sick 12 years? Oh, okay. Thank you, God, for the blessing to the reading of the word.